The last of three Conte di Cavour class battleships, Leonardo da Vinci did not lead a charmed life. Completed in May 1914 and lost to a magazine explosion two years later, she had one of the shortest services of any battleship of any navy that wasn't directly sunk by hostile action, though there is admittedly some debate on the exact cause of her sinking. As this video is not a direct ship overview, though it might as well be considering her short service, this is going to focus not on the design of da Vinci as a ship, that will come in the Cavour video when I reach it. Instead, this is going to focus entirely on her brief service life and the Herculean salvage effort that brought her back to the surface. To begin with the service history, laid down in July of 1910, launched in October of 1911, and only completed in May of 1914, Da Vinci had a rather protracted construction time. The fitting out stage in particular took quite a while. This was due, primarily, to the lagging supply of her main guns, which is also responsible for her sister ships taking relatively long to actually enter service. That's what happens when Britain is responsible for either helping you build your guns, or in the case of Da Vinci, actually building your guns, right before World War I. On the subject of World War I, those who know their history will, of course, realize that this means Da Vinci entered service all of a couple months before that war kicked off. This does mean that she didn't get to do the usual peacetime things for a capital ship, instead spending the first year of the war working up in training while Italy was still neutral. When Italy did join the Great War in 1915, well, Da Vinci would make like the other Italian capital ships and spend her time down towards the southern end of the Adriatic, flinging insults and come out to fight me towards the Austrian fleet. Leaving aside the need to save coal, such was Italy's need for coal that the industry would rob the navy of its stocks, the Italian naval leadership was, shall we say, very leery of risking their big and expensive dreadnoughts. This is fair, as the Adriatic is small and very easy to get ambushed in. It does mean that the Vinci saw absolutely no combat service whatsoever. For all of 1915 and most of 1916, she remained in port and would only rarely leave for gunnery training and other such things. Even that was limited, as she would honestly spend the vast majority of her time in the war at anchor doing nothing at all. Had that been all she got up to, well, she would have been the same as her sisters in this regard. Unfortunately, in a sad trend of the times, Da Vinci would suffer a magazine explosion at anchor on August 2nd of 1916. No one, to this day, knows exactly what caused that explosion. As one could probably expect, the Italians were quick to blame the Austrians, since they were, after all, at war with Austria-Hungary. So your ship exploded, blame sabotage. Some authors do believe it to be more likely either poor powder quality, poor powder handling, or some combination thereof. No one knows for sure. What we can say is that this was a relatively minor explosion, as these things went, though it was still enough to sink her. While not blowing her bow, or stern in this case, off or completely wrecking her beyond all hope of repair, like some similar incidents, Da Vinci would still capsize in place. The explosion opened two large holes in her hull and wrecked the deck around her aft turret. This damage, in addition to blowing her watertight subdivision to pieces, meant she was basically less watertight and more water open at this point. Bad puns aside, her boiler spaces also flooded due to the tunnels for her propeller shafts being open. Furthermore, she sank so quickly that many open hatches were unable to be closed, allowing further water into the ship. With all of this water entering the ship, Da Vinci sank within 10 minutes, with the loss of 21 officers and 227 sailors. The force of capsizing into the mud beneath her led to the bridge and funnels and masts all breaking apart, though the heavy turrets and conning towers just contrived to dig themselves into the mud. 
This process would take some time, as the thick mud only slowly yielded to the weight of the ship sinking into it. As a result, a good portion of the bow remained above water. This did gradually sink deeper into the mud, though, until, in the end, Da Vinci would be stuck fast in the mud, canted at a slight angle, and completely sunk in place. For most ships, and most navies, this would be the time that she gets broken up in place, written off as impossible to salvage and not worth anything but scrap value. The Italians decided to go, yeah, no, we're salvaging the ship, do you know how much money we spent on this? And proceeded to do just that. In a Herculean effort of engineering and sheer bullheaded stubbornness, they set to work. While multiple different options were put forth, in the end, the choice made was to make the ship airtight and raise her from the bottom without trying to right her first. The initial process was slow, as one could expect, with Italian industry already rather overloaded by supplying the war effort. When resources were finally sufficient to begin the salvaging operation, in 1917, it started by setting up equipment to blow compressed air into what watertight spaces remained. This started lowering the water level and made it possible for workers to remove the remaining ammunition from the bow and amidships magazines, along with emptying her coal bunkers, further lightening the ship. These actions did result in rising her up a bit, but as one could expect, you can't refloat a ship with gaping big holes in her, no matter how much compressed air you pump in. As such, divers set out to seal all the underwater holes in her hull, be they from damage or just openings that couldn't be closed in time before she sank. In particular, attention was placed on the holes caused by the explosion, which you could imagine took quite a bit of work to seal. When this was complete, the Italians went a further step forward, and repeatedly raised and lowered the ship with compressed air to work the turrets and guns free. This was because the heavy turrets made the process of raising the ship even more difficult than it already was. In fact, the Italians even outright cut off the entire barbette of turret 2 to further lighten Da Vinci. All this work would lower her weight by something in the range of 6,000 tons. So basically, they just took off the equivalent of a light cruiser's worth of weight before they had even raised her completely. For their part, those turrets would be left in the mud for later salvage. All of this work continued into 1919, when, with the aid of flotation cylinders to help with buoyancy, the ship would be raised over the course of September. Leonardo da Vinci would be afloat again, albeit still upside down, on September 17, 1919. Still upside down at this point, she would be moved into dry dock and placed atop special wooden shoring that had been set up to support her, as obviously no ship is designed to be upside down in general, and certainly not out of the water. Her decks could by no means support the weight on their own. Left like this for over a year, the Italian engineers would spend that time repairing the remaining damage and draining the remaining water to clear out the mud and debris of the sinking along with recovering the remains of those who were trapped inside when she sank. I do not envy the men who had to do that, considering how long those bodies were underwater. When all of this work was complete, she was put back in the water, still capsized at this point, remember, and towed to a special trench the Italians had dredged just for this purpose. By filling her starboard double bottom, the ship gradually began to shift, basically rolling over again. Under complete control this time, at least, as the Italians only filled her enough that, with the aid of a couple submarines and several lighters, she was set to enough of an angle that she finished rolling back on her own. So it was that on January 24th, it took a couple days to do this, of 1921, Da Vinci was finally righted and floating properly again, albeit with a heavy list to starboard that had to be corrected. A list of 22 degrees, in fact, which is nothing to sneeze at. After that was corrected, she was towed back to dock and left there as her fate was decided and her turrets were recovered, which further required the Italians to design an entirely new device to do that as well. This is also the point where we move from her salvage into the question that bedeviled the Italians. What to do with this Hulk now that they'd spent so much effort getting her back to normal? Da Vinci was, by this point, an obsolescent ship. 
Her sisters remained in service because Italy couldn't afford to replace them, but da Vinci would be incredibly expensive to even refit to her old, and by now outdated, standard. Let alone modernizing her. So, what to do with her? This is the point where multiple suggestions were made. The simplest, and most obvious, of course, being just restoring her to her 1916 condition, aside from various wartime improvements made to her sisters. This would result in a ship that was equivalent to her sisters, yes, but it would also be a ship that was a bit long in the tooth. If not in actual age, then certainly in comparison to contemporary ship designs. This option was probably the worst choice, since it would just leave her needing further modernization on top of the cost of restoring her in the first place. Another option, that was relatively simple to do, would have replaced her amidships turret with a set of six 4-inch anti-aircraft guns. While the image of a dreadnought with a turret replaced by anti-aircraft guns in the 1920s is an interesting one to think about, uh, it was still not the best option in the world. Her speed might increase a bit from the lightning of weight, but she would still be fundamentally the same obsolescent ship, just now with three less main guns, and some anti-aircraft guns that would eventually need to be replaced by newer mounts. I'm ignoring the later rebuilds of her sisters here, because the Italians would have had no idea at the time that they would go so extreme on that. Past those two... Well, if there were other suggestions, I haven't seen them, though I do imagine there probably were other ideas put up. Her hull could theoretically have been converted into a small carrier, I suppose, but there's no real evidence of this being considered, and the Italians didn't even do this with the undamaged hull of their one incomplete super dreadnought. As it would turn out, in spite of the heroic efforts of those who salvaged her, da Vinci would be seen as economically infeasible to restore. It would have cost something in the realm of 60 million lira to restore her even to her original configuration. Between the state of the Italian economy at the time, the fact that the French had managed to succeed in losing one of their dreadnoughts to running her aground, and the plain fact that da Vinci remained heavily deteriorated from her time underwater, she would be sold for scrap in March of 1923. Leonardo da Vinci had an incredibly short service life, but the story of her salvage is still an inspiring one for naval engineers to this day.